But she looked in all his usual favourite places in the house, in the neighbourhood, even in the woods, and she called all his friends parents, Sally went on. When she still couldn't find him, well, that's when she called me. I told her to call the police. They've been looking for him since. What time was it? She looked at her bare wrist. Joel glanced at his watch. It's 5.03, he said. And you're here for... Dad's donuts? But listen, I'll just go. Joel had to get out of here. Thinking about the kid in the ditch was one thing, but now thinking about Caleb lying in the ditch. No, he couldn't do that. Never mind the donuts, he said quickly. Then he added, that's just awful about your grandson, I'm so sorry. He turned and trotted out of the building before Sally could respond. Three hours later, his nerves pulled so taut, he figured he could probably pluck them like guitar strings. Joel followed his dad into Herb's hardware in the middle of downtown. He had to concentrate to be sure his movements were casual and relaxed, not at all the way he felt. Could he pull off this nonchalant act for the rest of the day? When Joel had returned to his dad's truck, he'd had to explain why Sally hadn't made the donuts. And of course, his dad had immediately gotten out of the truck and gone inside to talk to Sally. Not sure what he should do, Joel had remained in the truck, where he'd sat stiffly, chewing on his thumbnail. He wasn't sure how long he'd sat there. Pretty long, he figured, because the sun was rising when his dad came back out. Joel nearly jumped through the truck roof when his dad threw open the truck door and got back in. The police chief is organising a search, he said. Joel blinked at his dad. Huh? His dad shot him a look. For Caleb, they're organising a search. Joel nodded and swallowed. He cleared his throat. Has anyone seen... He began. He was uneasy about asking any questions. What if someone had seen his truck near Glenwood Fields last night? Oh, God. Joel's dad started his truck and put it in gear. Montgomery and his officers are going door to door now. So far, no one said they saw anything. It was all Joel could do not to jump up and yell, yes. It was, it was all Joel could do not to... J oh, yeah, I guess that makes sense. Uh, that, that was one worry he could set aside. All the time he'd been telling himself he should go back and check on the kid, a nagging thought had been in the back of his mind. What if someone had seen what he'd done? No one had. So, if he said nothing, if he kept acting clueless, no one would know. He could go on with his life as if it never happened. Yeah, as if he could forget it. We need to get back to the, to the nursery, Joel's dad said. I want you to get the deliveries loaded while I do some things in the office. We'll open for a couple hours, but then we'll close up. We'll go help out with the search. Close? Joel yelped. The only day he'd ever wanted to work, and they were going to close? Help with the search? Joel didn't want to be anywhere near the search. It's the right thing to do if Caleb isn't found right away. I've already talked to Montgomery on the phone. I told him we'd head over to the hardware store later this morning and get what we need to make some signs and maybe a command centre for the search. And here they were. Herb's hardware was in one of the town's oldest buildings. It had worn rough wood floors, high tin ceilings and an old-fashioned cash register. The store smelled of wood, varnish and dust. The shelves crammed with tools and home improvement stuff went from floor to the super high ceilings. Joel didn't think the top shelves had been cleaned in years. Feeling like a little kid, Joel shadowed his dad as he strode through the store, gathering supplies for signs and a command centre. He didn't complain about being here, because ever since the kid he'd hit had been given a name, Joel had felt like he was sleepwalking. Or no, it was more like he wasn't in control of his own body. Part of him wanted to be a million miles away, not giving a crap about what was going on. And part of him wanted to go back to that ditch and see if the kid, if Caleb, was still alive. Because he couldn't bring himself to do either of those things. He was just numbly following his dad around. Get a bundle of those steaks, Joel's dad said, pointing. Joel blinked and turned toward a shelf full of packaged wooden steaks as his dad went around the end of the Nile. Joel lifted a bundle and started to follow his dad again. A clicking sound stopped him. It was soft ticking, like plastic tapping on wood, and it was coming from behind him. 
Joel word, word, world. Nothing was there. He looked left and right and then down the aisle all the way to the picture window at the front of the store. Something small and yellow caught his eye through the window. He sucked in his breath. Was that a... He took a couple steps toward the window, squinting. It was. A kids at play plastic figure was sitting outside the hardware store, right by the window. It was positioned so it looked like one of its black eyes was looking through the window, watching Joel. Joel took a step back and thought hard. Had that been out front when he and his dad had gotten here? He remembered seeing a row of rakes and wheelbarrows. Had there been a plastic kids at play figure too? He shook his head. He didn't think so. From behind him, the ticking sound started again. It sounded like small footsteps, footsteps made by plastic shoes or plastic feet. Joel held his breath and turned. Nothing. Clutching the bundle of stakes, Joel hurried down the aisle to the back of the store. There he turned left and headed into the hardware store's annex, an old add-on that contained work clothes, boots, gloves, overalls and hats. He tried to tell himself he was imagining things, but then he'd heard the clicking again. The thing he was hearing had fo was following him. This time, Joel didn't even turn to look. He just took off again. He strode out of the annex and back into the store, and into the back of the store, ducking this way and that around baskets of plumbing parts, lighting displays, and rows of power tools. Everywhere he went, he heard that faint plasticky clicking following him. He had to get out of here. Joel made a turn to get back toward the front of the store. Head down, hugging the bundle of stakes like it was a teddy bear, he stepped forward and ran right into his dad. Joel yelled so loudly, his voice echoed off the ceiling. He dropped the stakes. What are you doing? His dad snapped. Um, Joel ignored his dad and listened carefully. He didn't hear anything except his own uneven breathing. Pick that up and come on. I've got everything else by the counter, his dad said then turned and walked away. Joel picked up the stakes and meekly followed. He moved slowly, still listening for the clicking sound. He heard nothing. You coming? His dad asked. Joel made his feet move. He followed his dad. At the counter, Joel's dad paid for everything he'd stacked in their cart while Joel kept his back to the picture window. He didn't want to look at the yellowish figure. Instead, he listened for the clicking. Joel was still listening when his dad tugged on his sleeve. What's wrong with you? I said we're ready to go. Joel again followed his dad without speaking. When they stepped out through the front door, Joel made himself look over at the kids at play figure. He noticed a price tag dangling from the figure's hand. He screwed up his face in concentration. If the thing had a tag, it must have been here for sale when he and his dad had arrived. Why couldn't Joel remember seeing it? Joel's day got better after he and his dad left the hardware store. He basically spent his afternoon on his own walkabout, nowhere near where Caleb was the night before. This was his part in the search. By the time late evening came, Caleb hadn't been found. Joel and his dad headed home and had dinner. Joel was still wound up tight, but his parents interpreted his behaviour as worry for Caleb. In a way, it was. Or rather, it was worry for Joel because of Caleb. Finally, Joel was able to get away with saying, I'm beat. I'm going to go to bed so I can get up early and help out tomorrow too. As his parents said goodnight to him and his mother got in her. Wait, as his parents said goodnight to him and his mother got in her. What? That, that doesn't make sense. And Joel, you really must shower. He wondered how long it would be before Kayla's body, if it was in fact a body by now, would start to smell and attract animals. Caleb would be found then, surely. The ditch wasn't that far away from the houses. Once again, as Joel went into his room, he heard the inner voice that told him it might not be too late. He might be able to save the boy. You could be the hero, the voice said. Yeah, Joel would be a hero, until the boy was well enough to describe who hit him. The boy had looked right at Joel in those few seconds while the truck skidded. The town was small enough that the boy could know who he was. Joel seemed to recall that Sally said her daughter went to the garden centre all the time. Odds were that the kid had been there too. Nope. Joel wouldn't risk finding Caleb. Instead of doing something that would throw his life away, Joel took a shower that his mum kept going on about. 
When he was done, he thought about messing around with his drum pads, but he really was wiped out. Joel, in just his boxes, cool drummers didn't wear PJs, <laughs> sat down on the edge of his bed. He turned on his bedside lamp. It immediately illuminated something that shouldn't have been there. He gasped and jumped up. What the hell? Joel gawked at the little plastic yellow figurine that stood next to his digital alarm clock, propped up against the base of his lamp. It was the figurine from the Faz Crunch box, that creepy little kid-shaped figure with its empty black eyes and its flag at attention warning, kids at play. Joel had tossed that aside. When was that? Yesterday? It seemed like a month ago. Yeah, it was yesterday. How did the figure get in his room? Joel didn't have to think hard on that one. His mum probably found it and brought it up here to make a point. She hated that when she hated when he left things lying around. When he was a little boy, she'd pick up after him. When he got into high school, though, she started just putting his stuff in a bin in the garage. He'd have to go out there and dig through the pile to find things like his softball glove, his rollerblades, his sunglasses, or his earbuds. Wait a minute. Yeah, she usually puts his stuff in the garage. She never brings it up to his room. So why would she have brought this up? Maybe his dad did it? Whatever. Didn't matter how it got here. Joel reached out and snatched up the figurine. As he stared at it, his muscles tensed. And suddenly, it felt like an ice cube was skittering down his spine. He shivered. All the kids at play figures he'd seen today. That weird plastic clicking sound in the hardware store. And now this. It felt like he was being haunted by his conscience. Do the right thing, it was telling him. Go back and save the kid. Save Caleb. Joel closed his hand over the figurine. He held it so tight that the edges cut into his palm. The problem was that the right thing was right for Caleb, but it was wrong for Joel. If Joel went to the kid, whether Caleb was dead or alive, Joel would get in the kind of trouble that would really mess him up for the rest of his life. Really, the whole thing came down to the boundaries of life here that Joel so hated. If he was going to be free of them, he couldn't go check on Caleb. Doing that would not only keep Joel stuck in this town, it might literally put him in a jail cell. He wouldn't be able to survive that. Keeping quiet was a matter of self-preservation. Self he shook his head. No way. He wasn't going to sacrifice his future for one stupid little kid who shouldn't have been running around in the dark in the middle of the night. Who lets that kid do that? Joel thought. He tried to tell himself it was only a matter of time before the kid got hurt. It just so happened to be that t Joel was the unfortunate bystander who hit him. Really, this was on the parents for not locking up the house or keeping an eye on their son. Dropping the figurine onto his navy and beige Turkish carpet, Joel stomped on the ugly little dude until it broke into multiple pieces. When he noticed the kids at play flag was still unscathed, he reached down, picked it up, and snapped it into three pieces. He gave it one last look, ignoring the way their hair bristled at the back of his neck. Then, he turned away from it. Hmm. He took a deep breath and let it out. For the first time all day, he felt relaxed. He'd made his decision, and he was okay with it. Calmly getting into bed, Joel closed his eyes. Tonight, he wasn't tormented by doubt or by questions of right and wrong. He was perfectly satisfied that he'd done what he needed to do to look out for himself. He went right to sleep. Joel's eyes shot open. He blinked and looked around. He'd been dreaming about the stupid little toy from the Faz Crunch box. But why had he awakened? Joel rubbed his eyes and turned to check his bedside clock. It read 1.35am. Not joking. 2am. <laughs> exactly. That was weird. He couldn't remember the last time he'd woken up and the clock was right on the hour. It was... Joel sat up. Okay, that was really weird. He hadn't planned on sitting up. He planned on closing his eyes and going back to sleep. He didn't have to pee. He wasn't thirsty. He was still tired. Why would he sit up? Joel threw back the covers and stood. What the hell? He didn't want to stand up. Why was he standing up? Oh my god. It's taking control of his life. Oh my god. Joel stood ramrod straight and looked around the room as if his neck was on hydraulics. His head movements seemed stiff and jerky. What was wrong with him? His neck felt bizarre. Come to think of it, his whole body fell off. It felt locked up and unyielding. When Joel had been about eight, he'd gone on a boat with Wes and his family, and he'd suddenly got badly sunburnt. 
Not only had the burn hurt like crazy, it had made his skin so taut that he couldn't move properly. He felt a little like that, but worse. It wasn't just his skin, his joints didn't feel right either. They felt like they did when he worked out too hard without warming up. Joel's head turned to look at his chest of dwarves? Drawers. Now why was he looking over there? Joel's leg lifted, and he took one step toward the chest. He tried not to. He had no reason to go over to his chest of drawers. He wanted nothing that was in it. Not right now. What he wanted was to go back to bed and sleep. This is basically The Sims. <laughs> Instead, he took another step toward the chest. He felt like his body wasn't his anymore. He took another step, and another, and another. Soon, he stood in front of his chest of drawers, and his arm lifted. His hand grasped the bronze knob on the drawer, and he pulled it open. He reached in, and grabbed a fresh pair of jeans. No! The toy is now basically, um... I guess you could say possessing him. That's not the right word, but you know what I mean. Controlling him. And it's going to control him to go over to Caleb. 100%. I, I, I bet that's what's going to happen. Um, <coughs> every motion he made felt stiff, as if his joints had seized up and needed to be oiled so he could move properly. He was surprised he didn't creak or whir as he moved. His movements felt like those of the clunkiest of old school androids. No, his movements were even more basic than that. They didn't remind him of an old robot. They reminded him of a puppet, one of those wooden ones with the strings attached to the joints. His motions weren't his own, like his body was being forced into motion. He could even hear his joints crack as they moved, as if they were protesting the directives the directives uh, being given to them. As his hand closed the first drawer and opened the second to pull out a t-shirt, Joel concentrated hard on resisting his body's actions. He wanted to go back to bed. He imagined himself doing that, but imagining was all he could do. Instead of going back to bed, he got dressed. Then he reached out to, his op to open his bedroom door. The hall outside his room was dark and silent. The clock in his mother's office, a big grandfather clock she said was a Hamley, a Hamley, a family heirloom, likely cared, ticked loudly. From behind the closed door at the other end of the hall, his dad's snores attempted to drown out the clock's even rhythm. Joel thought about calling to his parents. Maybe they could snap him out of whatever was going on with him, but he couldn't make a sound. Is this like a... Um, this is also like sleep paralysis, right? Because this this kind of this sort of thing happens to people sometimes. Um, I believe it's sorry. Give me a little second to explain. I believe it's when you're like in REM sleep, which is random eye movement. Um, that's the state of sleep where you dream. Uh, some people wake up during that state because you're in that for like I think it's like six times a night. Some people wake up during that stage of sleep. And because of that, they're kind of dreaming, but it's layered onto the real world. So you're kind of hallucinating, which is which is kind of dangerous sometimes. I've I've heard there's like a story where someone jumps out of a window and then breaks loads of their bones because of sleep paralysis. It's horrible. Uh, this is, it kind of just reminded me of that. I'm, I'm sorry if I took a while to explain that. Um, he walked, stiff-legged, down the hall to the top of the stairs. He then began a decent, so awkward, a decent, a descent, so awkward that several times he thought he was going to topple forward and fall, end over end, end down the stairs. It wasn't that his body was moving wrong, it was that it was in such a state of resistance. His own body's will versus that of some outside force he didn't understand, that he was totally off balance. Somehow he reached the base of the steps, at this point... His body turned and pointed itself toward the kitchen. It made its way back to the door. There, using an arm that felt like a stone appendage, he brought up his hand to grab the knob. Joel stepped off the back porch. He headed around the house toward the driveway. He felt like he'd become a small version of himself and he was now trapped inside the large version. He was being taken for a ride by this big Joel creature who had an agenda little Joel knew nothing about. Every time Joel sh swung a leg out, it felt like his leg belonged to someone else. Each time he planted his foot, he felt like his foot was in a cement shoe. But he kept walking. He strode, totally against his will, down the driveway to the road in front of his house. The night was cooler, 
than usual for this time of year. A breeze was coming down off the mountains, bringing with it the hint of a frost. Fragile spring green leaves fluttered on tree branches near the road. Fallen blossoms whispered as they skimmed over the pavement. The night sky was similar of that that was similar to that of the previous night. Stars twinkled above, like all was right with the world, and an ever so slightly thicker wedge of moon sent pale rays of white light down to illuminate the cement in front of Joel. Even without the warm yellow glows reaching out from porch lights and lampposts in the yards along the street, he'd have been able to see just fine. Not that it mattered what he was seeing. Joel was pretty sure that even if he'd gone totally blind, he'd be moving along the street without a problem. He wasn't the one calling the shots, so why did he need to see anything? His legs pivoting sluggishly at his hips, their rigid, their rigid extensions uh, lifting ahead of him like horizontal pistons, Joel headed down the street. After just a few steps like this, the creaking he thought he should hear when he was in his room actually began. Every time his leg raised out ahead of him, his joints rasped and groaned. It sounded like his joints were rusting. He'd heard lesser creaks from ancient oxidized gate hardware. The garden centre had a gate with hinges like that. The sound they made was straight out of a horror movie. Creak. <laughs> oh, that was the way Joel's joints sounded as he walked. Oh. But it wasn't the way his body sounded that concerned him, it was the way it felt. Leaving aside the terrifying fact that he was no longer in control of his own movement, his body was starting to feel as unyielding as the granite up in the mountains that overlooked the town. Unfortunately though, it didn't feel as strong as the granite. It felt, well, fragile. He felt like instead of being made of rock, or even on wood, he was made of some kind of hard plastic. And he felt like he was fragmenting, disconnecting from himself. Joel didn't know how long he'd been walking because looking at his watch wasn't something his body wanted to do. However, given that he was now leaving his neighbourhood, he guessed he'd been on his hijacked journey for, the, for at least 10 minutes. During whatever length of time he'd been out here though, he'd noticed his body was starting to feel strained, as if he was reaching some sort of breaking point. He was starting to hear cracks interspersed with the creaks in his movement. Were his bones fracturing? He wasn't in horrible pain or anything, he just felt wrong. He no longer felt like him, like a human. He was feeling more and more like a thing. He was also feeling more and more panicked. The panic rose as it became clear where his body was taking him. When Big Joel had gone to turn out of his neighbourhood, He'd, re he'd veered left on the cutover road that led to Glenwood Fields. Joel was heading back to where Caleb, or where Caleb's lifeless body, lay in a ditch. I told you, I told you. Joel screamed in his mind. His mouth could no longer make sounds. It couldn't even open. It felt like it had just been welded shut. And it was one of the systems in Joel's body that was shutting down. In spite of the fact that Joel's movement had been laboured, he couldn't help but notice he wasn't sweating at all. Nor was he breathing heavily. He was scared. More scared than he could ever remember being. And yet, his heart wasn't racing. In fact, he couldn't sense any heartbeat. Usually, if he concentrated, he could feel his pulse. Not anymore. When he put his attention on his neck or his wrist, he felt nothing. And now, as his panic began to morph into despair, he realised he couldn't generate tears either. He could feel that his face was an expressionless mask that in no way reflected how he felt on the inside. Anyone observing him would think he was perfectly calm. Was anyone observing him? Joel wanted to look around to see if anyone was looking out their window at the freakish figure lumbering by. But did he really look freakish? Or did he just feel that way? He couldn't see himself, of course. But given how he felt... He didn't think that anything he was doing would look normal. He felt as if he was moving, like a flash-frozen zombie. His surroundings seemed to shudder as he looked at them. In spite of all the systems in Joel's body that were outside his control, his eyes were still his to use. He couldn't turn his head to look around, but he could see whatever was in front of him. And there, just a couple hundred yards away, were the entrance stones to Glenwood Fields. <laughs>
shaped vaguely like angel wings, but dingy grey instead of white. The entrance signs were far grander than anything within the subdivision. Joel had always thought the houses in this area were pathetic, shallow-roofed structures shaped like L's, with simple siding and plain small windows. Houses like these deserved a flimsy wood design, uh, a flimsy wood sign, not an elaborately carved set of huge stones. As Joel got closer and closer to the stone markers, he noticed that they looked more like gravestones than entrance signs. That seemed oddly inappropriate now. Or oddly appropriate now, sorry. Given that they marked the spot where Caleb likely lay dead. Joel's mind offered up an image of a child's dead body, its face waxen, its eyeballs eaten by scavengers. As soon as this horrific visual flashed through his brain, his thoughts screamed, just as he would have if he'd seen something like that in real life. Was he about to see something like that? His feet, which he can no longer feel, were crunching through the gravel on the shoulder of the road by Glenwood Fields' entrance. He was no more than a couple of yards from where the kid had been standing in the road when Joel had hit him. If Joel could have turned and taken two or three steps to his left, he would have been able to reach the edge of the ditch. He might have been able to look down the steep embankment to see whatever was lying in the narrow, rocky bottom of the ditch. He would have been able to see for himself, finally, whether Caleb was dead. But Joel couldn't turn, and he couldn't go anywhere. He wasn't being compelled to go. He was not much different than a toy figurine at this point, subject to the whims of whoever or whatever wanted to position him. And apparently, this was the spot. Joel stopped moving. For several long seconds, Joel was still. He could tell he was just off the pavement, right where he'd hit Caleb. He could even see the black snake-like track of his skid marks on the grey street. Joel wondered if this was it. Would he be released now that he'd been brought to this point? Had the whole purpose of this body snatching been to get him where he'd refused to go? Joel didn't get much of a chance to ponder this question before the answer revealed itself. No, this was not it. His ordeal was not over. In fact, it was about to get much worse. Much worse. Joel felt an ache begin in his mouth, at the roots of his teeth. It was a dull pain, but it was noticeable. What did it mean? What was happening in his mouth? Jake? Jake? I think that's supposed to say Joel. Right? I think that's supposed to say Joel, but it says Jake. For goodness sake. <laughs> uh, I got excited then. Joel was now so terrified that he felt a scream climb up his throat and into his mouth, but it didn't come out. It couldn't. Joel wasn't able to control his vocal cords. Joel did, however, open his mouth for the first time since he left his house. Apparently, it wasn't welded shut because he could sense his lips hinging apart. He even heard the opening. A little smack and suctioning sound preceded the sensation of air moving against his gums and his tongue. That sensation was barely noticeable because of how much the pain in his teeth commanded his attention, but he knew it meant his mouth was open. Suddenly, the pain in his teeth stopped, and he felt something different. He heard something different, too. The sound he heard was a quiet clicking, a faint intermittent tapping like the sound of pebbles dripping to the ground. It felt like pebbles falling, too, in his mouth. Small hard bits were dropping into his tongue and tumbling past his lips. No, not, not small hard bits. Teeth. One of the bits rolled across his lower lip in a way that allowed him to feel the smooth surface on one side and the rough surface on an adjacent side. He also felt the triangular shape of the end of the bit. It was a tooth. The sound he was hearing was his teeth landing among the small jagged rocks that made up the gravel beside the road. While Joel tried to make sense of this inexplicable event, he felt one of the bits fall back, down his tongue. It lodged in his throat, and he felt like he was gagging. He wanted to, he needed to, cough up the tooth and spit it out, but he couldn't control his neck muscles any more than he could control any part of his body. All he could do was imagine himself choking to death while the tooth stuck to his throat. Crazed with disbelief, Joel's inner voice shrieked and shrieked and shrieked, but his inner vo voice had no vo volume, 
No one could hear him because he made no sound. His sight, his hearing, and his inability to f and his ability to feel pain were the only things Joel had left. He was pathetically grateful for these small gifts until his eyes showed him what was happening next. A tuft of black hair fluttered out in front of Joel's vision. It got caught on a current in the night's breeze and it wafted away. Another tuft followed the first, then a third, then a fourth. Then chunks of hair started dropping in front of his eyes. He felt more hunks slip down the back of his neck. Joel's hair was falling out. His silent shrieks turned into wails. Joel's consciousness, trapped within his traitorous body, could do nothing with the outrage and despair that strangled him from within. Every reaction he was having to the unspeakable things happening to him was being consumed by the black void of whatever controlled him. Make it stop, Joel thought. He didn't know who he was addressing. It was a universal appeal, a weak command from a peon in a universe that didn't care. Wow, um, that's that's a great that's a great line. Um, Joel didn't want to see anymore. He couldn't take watching another piece of who he thought he was falling away. Perhaps because he literally couldn't withstand the trauma of seeing anything else, his wish was granted. Joel's eyes dropped out of his head. He actually felt them disconnect and roll down his cheeks. As soon as his eyes left his body, he went blind. As horrifying as this was, at least Joel didn't have to watch his eyeballs drop to the gravel beneath his feet. He didn't have to see a sharp point of buzz... Ba I can't say this word. <laughs> I'm sorry, it, it's dumb, but I, I can't say this word. It's... <laughs> basalt. Basalt. Is it basalt or basalt? I, I think it's either. Um, he didn't have to see a sharp point of basalt puncture one of the brown irises. He did hear it, though. His ears ever so helpfully delivered to him the sickening splat of his eyes reaching the ground. His ears were also still doing their duty when Joel's fingers fell away from his hands. He heard his fingers clatter onto the ground like sticks hitting rocks. Before he could even begin to process this inconceivable mutilation, his hands disconnected from his arms. It felt like wires wrapped around the tendons and tore his hands from his wrists. He heard what was left of his hands land behind, beneath him. The sound was a crunchy thwack, similar to what he once heard when he had accidentally dropped his empty orange juice ga glass in his Faz Crunch cereal. For a second, Joel was nauseated by the sound, but only for a second. He didn't have time to linger for long over the sound of his hands hitting the ground because his awareness was immediately yanked to a new form of suffering. Now he could feel something pushing its way out through its through his empty eye sockets. It felt like some pulsing form was being pumped through the openings, something like a balloon or a ball being inflated. I just want to say, if this isn't a dream, this is basically pizza kit, but not a dream. <laughs> you know, like, another entity taking control of a body, like, all of the eyeballs popping out and, like, fingers. Ugh. Horrible. He could feel the pressure around the space where his eyes used to be. Um, the pressure built and built until he could sense whatever had been inflated was protruding out over his cheekbones. Once again, he didn't have long to think about this new abomination because the following one started immediately. The next thing to terrorise to terrorize him was his skin. He felt his skin beginning to snap apart and slip from his body. The sensation was similar to what he felt when sunburnt skin started to peel, but it was much stronger than that. Because it wasn't just the top layer of skin that was unravelling from him. It was every layer. His skin was flaying away from his muscles and his tendons. As his skin parted from what was beneath it, he felt the breeze sting his exposed tissues. It felt like some unseen hand was pulling his skin from his body, pairing uh, wet sections from him as if he was a fish being f filleted. I don't know what that means. He could hear the soggy strips slap the ground. He knew long ribbons of his skin were piling up beneath him because every sinew of his body felt exposed. Joel knew nothing. Finally, after being subjected to more heinous misery than any human could have been expected to survive, his consciousness succumbed to whatever force was orchestrating his transformation. The person 
that was Joel ceased to exist. Hmm, interesting. The partial moon dripped the pale, palest, sorry, not the palest, the palest of white glows above the tall mountain peaks east of town when Chief Montgomery's SUV rounded the corner and stopped just inside the stone-marked Glenwood Fields entrance. His radio squawked as soon as he turned off his engine. He picked up his mic, keyed it on, and listened. Chief, his dispatcher said, uh, I just got information. I just got confirmation from that Glenwood resident that the strange man he saw was headed toward the entrance. That's where I am, the chief responded. I'll check it out. He put his mic back into the holder and got out of his USV. A USV? SUV. Yeah, I'm tripping over my words. I don't know the English language. The angle at which the moon brushed the mountain range told the chief it was about 3 a.m. or so. Night still wrapped its blanket around his town. A surprisingly small man whose personality and authority didn't match his short stature, the chief grabbed his hat and pulled it over, thinning brown hair. He hefted his flashlight and got out of his vehicle. Chief Montgomery held his flashlight stiffly as he aimed it around the subdivision entrance. He'd been tense all day, ever since Jenna Bell had called him early in the early morning hours bef the day before. The long hours that Caleb had been missing had taken a toll on Montgomery and his officers. He felt like he'd aged at least five years since that call. Several times during the day, he'd told Jenna everything would be alright, but he wasn't sure he believed it. The chief turned in a slow circle, scanning the areas illuminated by the glows of his flashlight. He didn't see anything at first, but then he did. He froze, concentrating on the strange shape, hunched in the shadows just beyond the range of his flashlight. He stepped, toward, uh, he stepped forward so his light would land directly on the form. Montgomery gulped and took a step back. He immediately felt silly. His response had been ridiculous. What he was looking at was nothing to be upset about. The chief's flashlight beam lit up a large, misshapen plastic boy, positioned right at the edge of the road. The plastic figure had a mostly featureless face, no nose, no cheeks, no chin. All the face had was two bulging black eyes and an open, darkness-filled mouth. Montgomery had seen a few figures like this around town. It was part of some Freddy Fazbear public safety initiative to deter reckless drivers in areas where kids were running around. Most of the figures he'd seen were much smaller than this one. And this one was oddly contorted, as if some of the plastic had been deformed in the moulding process. That makes a lot of sense, honestly. I, I was thinking the um the gaping mouth and the, and the big eyes. It kind of reminded me of the puppet. I know it's not the puppet, but uh, that's something to uh to pick on because you know it's very protective in this. A bit like Coyle's the clown. Uh, for some reason, the shape disturbed the chief. He was spooked, but he couldn't possibly have explained why if anyone had asked him. He shook his head. He was just overtired. That was all. Too much stress. The chief started to move on and search beyond the bizarre figure, but then his light landed on something piled up on the ground. He tilted his flashlight downward and frowned in confusion. What was that? Mulch? What was Mulch doing out on the road? Leaning closer, he shined his light over what looked like glistening pinkish brown ribbons tangled together. Not ribbon, obviously. The mass of material appeared to be something organic, and for some reason, it gave him the heebie-jeebies. He shook off the shiver that ran through him. The ribbon-like lengths looked a little f like freshly stripped bark. He glanced to the side of the road as the trees clustered near the subdivision's entrance, looking to see if a tree had been ravaged by a vandal or maybe an animal. All of the trees looked okay, but from the top left of the trees he was focused on, Montgomery heard a whimper. He froze and listened. Was that really a whimper or the cry of some injured animal? He tilted his head and concentrated. There it was again. That wasn't an animal, it sounded like a child. The chief immediately shifted his light toward the ditch at the side of the road. That was where the sound was coming from. He hurried over to the edge of the road and aimed his light into the ditch. He couldn't see anything. Hello? He called out. Caleb? The whimper turned into a cry. Montgomery turned and ran toward his SUV. Reaching for his mic, he keyed it on. Rankin, get the EMTs out here to the Glenwood Fields entrance. I think I found the kid. He didn't wait for the response. He spun around and ran past the weird kids at play figure. When he got to the edge of the ditch, he slid down its side. I'm coming, Caleb. Hang on. 
The weak cry that answered him made his heart leap with hope. He scrabbled toward the sound, and when he saw the small boy wedged behind a pile of rock, he dropped to his knees. I'm here, Caleb. It's okay. You're going to be okay. As Chief Montgomery took off his jacket and laid it over the boy's narrow shoulders, he couldn't help but grin in triumph. He'd found the kid. Everything was going to be all right. <sighs> That's the end. Oh. Well, well, well. Well. <laughs> well. Um. I must say. Um. Spoiler for. Well, not really a spoiler, actually, but. For Prankster. I wasn't too fond of the ending. <clears throat> uh, I, I've also talked to people and they were not fond on the ending as well either. Um, a, a lot of people didn't like it. Um, they thought it ended very quickly, abruptly, and didn't make much sense. This one... It makes a bit of sense. Like, like... I don't get it. <laughs> I'm just gonna say it. I don't get it. Okay? Somebody tell me what is happening. <laughs> because this is the second story out of two in this book, which I just don't get. Like, once again, the lead up in this story was so good. When I was when I was first reading the story, I didn't say it, but I was absolutely loving it. I was in love with all the characters. I thought that the guy was such a douchebag, so he deserved whatever happened. Um, and don't get me wrong, I really like what happened to him. It was really well described. There were some nice lines in there. Um, and I kind of like the implications. But what does the toy have to do with it? Right? Am I being completely dumb? Like, I swear the toy... Like like the kid toy, and the and what was his name? I don't even remember his name. I swear the toy and uh, and flipping Joel. That's it. I swear the toy and Joel were literally just completely disconnected. Like why did Joel breaking the toy make him kind of like paralyzed and then explode when he got to the graveyard place thing? Not the graveyard. Um. That was like a thought. Uh, you know, you know what I'm talking about. I don't... I'm not sure. You know, at the moment, I don't think this book is one of the strongest. I think it's quite a weak book so far. Hopefully, it will be saved by Find Player 2. I'm really looking forward to that one. Uh, I mean, I better because I, I actually have... I've been a little bit disappointed with, with these last two. I mean, that one was a lot better than Prankster, I think, because it did kind of end properly and um, it was gory and I kind of liked some of the parts of it, but um, hopefully we will um, enjoy Fine Player 2 a little bit more. I don't know if I'm just in a bad mood today or something, <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I wasn't too fond of that ending, but... um. Thank you guys so much for watching. Tell me guys what you think. Uh, any theories as well? We haven't really talked much about that sort of thing. So any theories in the comments. And I will see you in the next video. Goodbye.